185 miles south a hardcore punk rock podcast let's just do it let's just fucking do it dude let's just, let's just fucking do this thing so this interview is taking place on April 12th 2019 Today I'm interviewing Max McDonald. He's one of my old friends. We've known each other from elementary school, and we probably became closer friends in junior high. Uh, we actually did a little band together that never really did anything. And then uh, I'm one year older in school from him, and I remember my uh, sophomore year, this dude came to uh, high school and was selling me seven inches. It was actually the first record I ever bought, and it was the No Motive uh, self-titled seven inch on the Insta Live Records. And I remember coming home from school that day and playing it on my dad's record player and just being blown away by how fast it was. Like, the drummer, he's like the fastest dude other than the dude from Lagwagon. You know, and maybe faster. So I was like, holy shit, like, this is what Max has been up to. What the fuck? And I was like, kind of jealous, you know, because you're like 15 years old and you're like, holy fuck, like, my friend is like, knocking it out of the park and I'm just some schlub like playing guitar in his, his uh, bedroom <laughs> still you know so uh, anyway this is Max and uh, we're going to talk a little bit so Max your dad was into music and stuff is, is that kind of how you got into playing music in general yeah that's right to some degree um, he didn't push it on me too hard but he uh, he was an engineer and uh, I spent my childhood going to the studios with him and kind of watching him. He was more like an advertising by the time I was uh, born. Before that, he did all the cool stuff. Like he, you know, he played bass in Billy Joel and Iron Butterfly for a stint. And uh, I think his biggest uh, accolade is that he, he recorded all the music for Spinal Tap. And so, you know, that, that actually kind of became more of a, a fun thing like a, a fun name drop thing later because when you're a kid no one like cares about that movie but when you're like once we started touring and doing all that kind of stuff like that would kind of like come up in a conversation people would always lose their minds but he uh he definitely didn't push it on me but there was always like a gut string acoustic guitar like behind the couch in the house and he would uh the the, the main thing he really showed me is he taught me three chords he taught me e a and D, and he and he just said, if you know these three chords, you could pretty much play every rock and roll song ever written, you know. So you'd play them, and you'd be like, you know, this here's Wild Thing, and here's Louie Louie, and then he'd be like, okay, now you just like flip them backwards, and like now you're playing Gloria, and he'd like he'd like play a few bars, and he'd be like, you know, Gloria, G L O R A, and then he would, say, and he he like would say like you know. Like, she smells like fish and she tastes like chicken. <laughs> and, I did, and I had no idea that those like were not the words to the to the music. And so like later on when I actually discovered that song, I was like searching for those lyrics and then I was like, oh, you know, because the the joke was like completely over my head. Right. And so you know, I listened to probably like four different versions of that song. I, everybody does that. I think like Patty Smith and Eric Clapton and all these people, but that lyric was a was definitely a Pat a Patrick McDonald uh Unique, unique to him for sure. <laughs> so then you're playing, like, what age are you playing guitar? Uh, about 11, 11 years old. I think it was like right around the time actually you and I had started playing together. Um, what was the name of our band? Atrocity, but it's embarrassing because we, <laughs> we, we thought that we were like sounding like a death metal band, even though we weren't, and that is actually like a legit death metal band called Atrocity. So it's like, <laughs> oh man, we were like double posers. Well, how are we supposed to know, you know? You no, just... I know, it's pre-internet, right? So how would you know? How would you ever know? Yeah, and I remember, you know, you and I had uh, grown up together, but we weren't that close. And the main reason I think we ended up being friends at that time is because I was in like, uh, I played saxophone in, in band. That's right. And I was kind of decent, so... I was I was playing in the higher level of uh, of like with all the eighth graders. Yeah, you're killing it in junior high. Yeah, and I was smashing on the saxophone. So, <laughs> so you know, you and I had like lunch period together, and I remember just like walking by you in the hallways, and you'd like throw me the devil horns, but with, like a really serious face, you know. And you had your pentagram <laughs> necklace, and your hair was all parted down the middle, and like 
You know, I, I was still just had like full on like wetsuit tan surfer kids. So it was, it was actually kind of kind of inspiring. So it was, it was pretty exciting. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we, we played our first show together too, right? Like we, we played in my, uh, my dad's practice space. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, he, he used to share... <laughs> he used to share his space was right next to Doctor No's recording uh-huh. uh, space or not recording, but their, their rehearsal space. And I swear, like he ended up next to Doctor No at one point, and another point he was in between uh, Fixated and Burning Dog. Uh-huh. And he he used to always call him Burning Dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd make fun of Doctor No because this was like what this was like ninety two or something. Yeah. So that was like the metal years. Sure. And he's like. These guys don't even play music. They just sit in front of the mirror all day practicing their hair flips. They're not. <laughs> so he was completely over his head too. That's awesome. So how did you uh, end up meeting the dudes from No Motive? Um, it was kind of serendipitous, I guess. You know, we we kind of actually found out that we knew each other from before, just because those guys are older than me. I'm I'm a. I was going into my freshman year, and they were all already one year out of high school. And to put it in context, you're 38 right now. Yeah, that's right. And so they, uh, well, I'm 37, but big difference. What? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. So. Uh, oh, dude. oh, yeah, you're right. That's fucked up. I'm old. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it was, yeah, I was actually just uh, hanging out at a house with some friends. Uh, some surfer guys and they knew uh, Pat and Jeremy and they had told them they were looking for a guitar player and I just happened to be in the room and they knew that I I played around on the guitar so I went over to Pat's house for the first rehearsal and he was like oh yeah I know you because he had dated <laughs> and Pat was like the, like a super popular guy in, in high school like he was on the water polo team and like he was very much like a, kind of a jock in that sense and so he knew pretty much all like all the surfers, all the jocks in town. And so naturally he was like dating like the hottest girl in school and like all that. So he, uh, I had known him from before because his girlfriend had a, had a younger sister my age and we'd kind of, they, they'd always have like parties and their parents were gone and I'd see him and Jeremy kicking around. They were like these kind of like, you know, these mysterious older guys that just seemed to have it all together. And, and so it was kind of interesting ending up in a room with those guys. And that was also the first time, uh, I mean, that first practice, it just, it blew my mind, like, because I had just been playing, you know, we talked about this with, like, with uh, Ill Repeat, what was the Ill Repeat record we were listening to the other day that was, like, earlier, like, the before they heard Demos. Bad Brains, probably, or the something? The Yeah, and we were, we were kind of tripping because they hadn't figured out how to do, like, that fast beat yet, they were kind of just doing it, like, sort of half, yeah. and, uh... And that, that's kind of how I was playing guitar too. It was all sort of like you know, dan chicka 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 dan chicka 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 dan, like like you know, the way you play the way you interpret punk when you're like when you don't know how to play yet. Right. And they're like, yeah, here, play this riff, and it's like, it's like this da na 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 thing, and and I was like, what is that? It sounds like like a waltz or something, or yeah. like like country music, yeah, yeah. you know. And so like they're like, just play it, like, and and we'll like we'll we'll tear into the song and and. uh so I learned the part, and then Pat starts playing drums, and it, I swear my fucking head exploded. Like, it was, it, you know, we played in this room with Harvey. It was like his bedroom and his house, the hardwood floors and windows everywhere, so the sound was just like... Yeah, he's room shouting like a motherfucker. Yeah, there was so much attack in there, and like he starts playing, and it just sounded like... I swear, I, I don't think I've ever like gotten a rush like that since. You know, it was the most amazing thing I've ever experienced. Really. Yeah, I mean, that's how it felt when I like listened to it, you know, and you... It's it's just so fast and the first song on the second side like kicking into like this killer like lead and shit. It's it was an insane record and it, it caught everyone by storm, right? It was like fire at Nard High. Yeah, and it, it, I think it was that perfect blend too of uh, you know we had a, we were kind of sandwich, sandwiching a bit of a high school generation in that sense because I was I was young and and because I grew up with a lot of the. The, the kids that listen to punk rock music in on the beach in the beach area there on Silver Strand, um, they all had older brothers that were their age and everything else, and so there was kind of like instant uh, cred because all the guys that had just graduated high school that we all looked up to knew Pat and Jeremy, and uh, and I was like kind of we were like sort of the incoming generation, and it kind of just glued everything together in a way where like even though we didn't know what the hell we were doing, like we could still get like a hundred people like packed into like a little living room somewhere and it was just it just 
everyone kind of fed off the energy of the fact that everyone was there and it was kind of the thing to do. Yeah, this is late 95, so, like, punk was already popular, right? But people are, like, grasping for something local they can go to. Yeah, because the, the scene was kind of... There were a lot of bands, but it, it was kind of the dark ages for Nardcore, I think, in general at that time. Right. I want to talk, just circling back uh, before No Motive, just about, like, punk broke in, like, 94, to so, like, the mainstream and so forth. But growing up as, like, kids on the beach and, like, in and out of skate and surf culture, there wasn't, like, an extreme hit, right? Like, oh, Green Day hit the radio, now everyone's punk. It's like, everyone had already been listening to, like, Bad Religion and Pennywise and, like, those kind of surf movie bands already, right? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, when I got into punk music and... When you grow up in those little Southern California beach towns, like it's such a fluid thing that it's kind of just happening in the background and it's kind of hard to pinpoint like when you really uh, start to identify with it because it, it was really a, you know, it was on all the surf movies that we would watch, all the skate, all the skate movies and stuff, skate videos, and it was basically kind of just a soundtrack for, for that lifestyle, not so much like... Uh, deep into the the culture of punk rock necessarily at that time you know it was just kind of happening everywhere plus like the older guys were all still kicking around too that played in those punk bands in the 80s so they was sort of they would sort of like pepper in like a thing here and there and like talk about the good old days or whatever right right so yeah it was um it was just kind of there and uh there were those bands were just getting ready to blow up too like like what Offspring became like one of the one of the biggest bands sure. around that time, but their first record Ignition, I think it's their first record. Yeah. Those songs were all over those like Taylor Steele surf videos and stuff, and so like it was actually like to a point that by the time Green Day came out, like I knew I wasn't supposed to like that, you know? Right. <laughs> it was like no, yeah, you're playing like, Tiny Green Day and you're 15. Exactly. Like I was okay with like some of those bands like being commercialized because we had already sort of discovered them but like seeing this band you never heard of they just come out and they look the right way and their videos are all really bright and poppy and it's just something about it just felt a little suspicious <laughs> <laughs> for sure so uh going back to no motive how did you like it was pretty cool because you actually like put a record out and that was interesting like at the time it's like you know bands are putting out demos that's all like a teenager can like wrap your head around right it's like doing some sort of recording and putting out a tape. But here's this, like, physical piece of wax, and, like, someone that has, like, no idea, like, really, like, the deep-rooted history of, like, punk rock or vinyl culture or anything. It's like, what is this? Like, can you can you talk about, like, how you decided to do a record? It, it was all Fred's idea? Yeah, like, it was all Fred Hammer, really. I mean, he, you know, Fred was, like, a swimmer guy, too. And uh, so him and Pat were really tight just because they were sort of Oxnard like swimmer dudes and um so he was kind of just kicking around all the time when we were rehearsing and uh and i knew him from surfing too and we you know we go to the shows we go to shows at the living room and stuff and he he let me ride in his car and i'd fold record sleeves for him the whole way up and it, it was just kind of a he just he just kind of he was just kind of made it we didn't even question it you know like particularly not me because i was younger than everybody he was just like this is what we're doing you know, we're going to go to John Lyons, we're going to record four songs, you guys are going to pay for everything, we're going to rip off Kinko's, we're going to like bang the key on the ground so you can't tell me copies you made of the, yeah. the record covers, and yeah. we're going to steal all the paper, and we're going to have a record, and you know, we just kind of were like along for the ride on that on that one. Yeah, but you kept plugging away, because it was only, what, a half a year later you did the split with the choice? Yeah, you know, I have a hard time nailing the timing down on that, but... But uh, it all feels like it happened really quickly because I joined the band the summer between uh, eighth grade and freshman year. And so the record came out like in the fall of my freshman year, which was uh, 90, 95, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the Choice Split came out like in early 96 or something like that. So it, they had to have been like within six months of each other. It is a little bit of like a growth in the sound, right? Like instead of just being like, straight speed and sticking on the same note like da 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 like you are you're writing like bass parts, right? Is like is that like the the pre and post like you heard ignite? I think I really you know I think it was is 
at that time, I don't know if we had discovered Ignite quite yet, but we were listening to Outspoken a lot. Mm. And, uh, they were pretty bass heavy as well. Yeah, they were pretty bass heavy and just like slower. So we, we kind of like introduced some of those. Um, we kind of introduced some of those like halftime parts into the songs and some things like that. I don't think there's a halftime part in. Yeah, one of the songs in the Choice Split kind of like slows down at one point. It's a little heavier, if I recall. But yeah, those those kind of like dreamy bass lines and stuff, I think those were a little bit more related to us hearing some of that like hardcore stuff for the first time, you know? Yeah. And then you jump right in your first full length, right? Cynical? Yeah. Yeah. So Cynical uh, came out on Edge Records, which was like the guy... Who played drums for the that late that later version of Stala? He started a record label, and uh, he uh, it was, he also wrote the lyrics in control the song. That's right. <laughs> I think he played on the demo. We'll find out. Yeah, and he also uh, trademarked Straight Edge from, and, and Narcor, from, from, right? Did he really? I didn't know that. That's pretty yeah. funny. Yeah, but he uh, you know he he soda and burritoed us at at a. Uh, <laughs> but what's that? It's not Baja Fresh, but something like that. And like, you know, he took us out to, to dinner and kind of wine and dine us and like gave us the whole spiel. And like, I think things had kind of gotten a little weird with Fred for a minute there because he was he was like beefing with some Ventura bands and some stuff like that was going on. And so, sure, look with him fall out, probably. Yeah, and also like, No Motive was always kind of like kind of ambitious, I guess. Like, we were always trying to like step it up with every, you know, with every new thing we did, we were always trying to like like grow it a little bit Mm -hmm. and so he kind of came out like like seeming kind of legitimate i guess yeah well he had he had done us that stall they came back he did that cd and then did did cynical come out before after he he did bleed no i think bleed already came out yeah so he like came back and he was like doing shit because bleed is awesome and he played on that as well he did he had a really interesting drumming style too he he would kind of like he would kind of stop playing the hi hat when he would hit the cymbal. I mean, you would have yeah. to stop playing the hi hat, but like, I think he would stop like one hit shorter. Like he had to like think about it for a second. It's like that jump skill. Yeah, like it was almost like a like he was like almost like a shitty drummer that got really good technically, but he couldn't like get past his shittiness. And so, it, but it like worked in this. I don't know. Like that bleed record is, yeah, is like something. You know, it's it's pure gold that like I think kind of went a little bit unnoticed. For yeah, we people. talked about that on the on the last one with Joe. The bleed record is the shit needs to come out on vinyl, and uh, yeah, that's that. So anyway, yeah, he was coming in, and he's also like another old school head that's like paying you a lot of homage, right? It feels good when you're young to have someone be like interested in you, especially like a dude with like a name. Yeah, and he was, and he was also kind of. He's like, yeah, we're going to bring you guys into a real studio. You know, we're going to produce this thing. Like, we're going to make a real record, you know. And, and hearing Bleed and uh, and the new stall had come out at that point. And, and, and to my young ears, that sounded like a really good, like, sonically, that sounded really awesome. No, they were, like, recording in a real studio, right? So, like, going back to what, we're, what we were used to, we explain a little bit about, like, recording at John Lyons at the living room. Sure, yeah. I mean, John Lyons... He was so key to like that entire generation of music, and uh, I mean, in retrospect, the way he did things was probably the best way you could have recorded young bands like that, which is just kind of like don't overthink it, don't overproduce it. Like I actually remember the first time we <laughs> went in the studio with him, we uh, we ran through the song, and he's like, "Cool, is that did you is that it?" <laughs> and we're yeah. like, "Can can we hear it?" And he's like why yeah like did you get it or did you not get it like that's that was but not like in a dickish way it was just like totally because if you wanted to hear it you had to like put down your instruments and then go into his room yeah he he didn't have like the capability of playing it back to you so just to like lay out what the living room was and the recording was like the living room was a place that that did shows like diy shows in the santa barbara Galita area and then there was also a engineer named john lyons that recorded bands I don't know if he just recorded on the weekends or he, he was a full time thing, right? And he recorded you for uh, ten bucks an hour. The first time I recorded with him, it was ten bucks an hour, and I think the last time I recorded with him was twenty bucks an hour. Yeah. But basically, you just go, and at the end, you say, "Did you like that or not?" And you know, like 
every time we recorded, we recorded all the music live, and then we go in afterwards for the vocals. But you guys are big time, right? You said you isolated a track once. Yeah, on the seven inch, we we had a song called "Remember" that had a guitar solo in it, and uh, I was still too shit of a guitar player to even play it. So Dave, uh, our original bass player's name was Dave Brandon, and he was actually the best musician in the band. Uh, just good at every instrument and he just so we we, we dubbed like the uh we dubbed the uh the guitar solo and i think that that was like that might have been the first time it, like john Lyons might have had to figure out how to do that <laughs> right, you had to like stack the tracks yeah exactly like so like we went in there like prima donna was like wanting to like do a solo like over the thing without just playing it raw and and uh it worked out because I would have I would have botched it if we had to do it live. So. Yeah, and and that was like he's recording on reels and stuff. And if I remember right, like I remember recording that once and like not even getting a tape to like listen to on the way home. Like we just got a dat. Oh yeah. It's like then we had to like figure out how to like get the music off the dat. So it's like you go record and it's like you don't even get the satisfaction of like listening to it on the way home. You know, it's like oh now I gotta like find a dude that can like get it off this dat. I know, and it, there's. <laughs> There's nothing better than like listening to that recording right after you made it. Like you're because oh, you know, know like what it takes us like 45 minutes or an hour to get home from Galita back sure. to Oxnard, and it's like wait you do a four song demo which is like what five minutes worth of music yep. <laughs> in those days and like you're just playing in the car the whole way. It never sounds more drivey and like more no. punchy than that that the first initial listen that you hear it after you record it no and i yeah. i never outgrew that like even when we did the first somali seven inch when i drove home from rogers that night like i listened to it the four songs like the entire way home so it's like an hour and a half of listening to four songs over and over it's like awesome i know and i think that's like for me, I think that's kind of like the the dragon that I chase the most. Like even with just playing music in general, is like I can, I can pretty much I can critique like everything, every piece of music I've ever made. You know, sure. And but that is the one moment when you never do that. Is like right after you record it, and every song is really good to you still. Like you haven't quite like gotten uh, enough of a departure from the song to like realize what parts of it are shitty, and so like. That that moment is like the thing that makes writing and recording music. Like, well, it's the so climax, fun. right? It's the climax of it. Like you've been building up, like writing this thing, and then you finally like get it out in the studio. And then like when you're in your car, if it sounds fucking dope, you're like, oh my god! Like it doesn't get any better than this. Right? You know, it is all downhill from yeah. there. Yeah, you can it can only get worse. From <laughs> yeah, there. It can only get worse. So anyway. That kind of like that builds a stage to you guys are gonna go like record in a real studio and like with like the like you're gonna have like Ryan Green did one song I think right yeah well we recorded that album twice because Joey had connected with this this local guy in Ventura named Stip, uh, Aaron Stipkovich I think I don't know he was kind of like a yuppie guy I think he was like an accountant that decided to throw it all down and just like you know go after his passion which was recording music digitally when digital music was not really the way to go yet. And so we recorded the whole record cynical with him. And it was just like, it was like appalling, like how bad it sounded. Like I was like, <laughs> dude, send me back to John Lyons, like right now. Yeah. You know? So he goes, okay, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to uh, the Valley and record in Ryan Green's studio with this guy, Adam something. And I think that, that, at, that this guy was like, kind of like a, a uh, Ryan Green protege sort of dude. Okay. And so we went in there, we cranked out the whole thing in three days, you know, like music one day, vocals the next day, and, and mixing the third day. And uh, Ryan didn't mix the song, but he kind of like, you know, he kind of like ambled into the studio and was like checking on Adam, like, oh, how are things going? And he's like, oh, you know, this and that. And, and then he pulls out like this, uh, this trigger that he uses like on all his... Um, on all, all the fat, you know, all the fat recordings yeah, that he did. Yeah, get that kick like, drum sound. Yeah, to get that sticky kick drum. And, like, to us, like, I could see, like, you know, like, there was, like, sunlight glowing off of this this piece of equipment sure. that he had. Just, like, oh, my God. Like, that's the thing that makes, you know, No Effects and Lagwagon and all these bands, like, sound awesome. Yeah. And so he plugs this thing in and, and, uh, and then kind of, like, you know, went on his way. And that was kind of his contribution. <laughs> Thanks, bro. To, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that that album was uh, 
like very transitional, you know, for us, like sound wise, because we were still playing a lot of fast stuff, but, um, dipping in to some more of the pop punk kind of stuff. And I think there was a, a like a, a reggae song on there or something. Yeah. Like, that, was a, that was a sick jam track. Dude, I, I remember being at a couple parties of it. The people were like, Damn, that song is sick. Oh, yeah, I went over well in the house parties for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, we'd be, like, playing that, and everyone would be bobbing their heads, and, like, Fred would be, like, ghost riding someone's bike off of their staircase. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, and that was, uh, what else was that? Oh, yeah, that song 924 was on there. Yeah, so yeah. we could jump back to that, actually, because, so you guys were playing basically just, like, locally and stuff, and you're, you're, you build up a really good following playing all around, like, kind of the 805 area, which is our, which is Ventura County. Mm -hmm. But you did branch out a little bit because you wrote a song about playing Gilman Street on that CD. So is that, was that your first time like going far out of town? I think so. Yeah. I think we played like a couple places in, you know, Coos Cafe or some spots like that, like down in Orange County. But uh, that was the first time we like, you know, we, we drove up there in a truck in like a Saturn, like a, like a coupe car or something. And uh, just hope that it didn't rain. And, and we, the Gilman thing had just been, like, building up in our minds, like, for so long, you know? Like, because Fred had kind of schooled us on that. Like, that's, like, the real, like, the real and only, like, DIY, like, punk club. Yeah, and, like, it, what, I mean, they're not, they're, they're actually very different. But, but what CBGB's is, like, name-wise on, like, the East Coast, like, maybe Gilman's like that out here. Absolutely. Right? Like, you, if you're a punk band... Or a hardcore band. It's like you want to play Gilman and you want to play CBGBs. Yeah. Yeah. And we we were just, I don't know, like in our minds, like that was like, oh, this is our, this is like our ticket, you know, we're going to go play like a real club, like in a real city and go do, not that Oxnard wasn't a real city, but like Oakland is in the Bay Area just is, I don't know, like the fact that we were traveling to play made all this, all of a sudden made everything feel really, really real. Sure. And uh, I actually remember Good Riddance was playing up there the night before. And so we drove up date early and watched them play. It was them and Fury 66. That was the first time I, I saw Fury 66, and they, they blew me away. But uh, I, <laughs> I, was, I was in the front, this, this like skinhead dude was like headbanging, and someone, I got pushed from the pit, you know, from behind, and <laughs> right in the back of this guy's head, and like, like it almost put my tooth all the way through my lip. and my tooth was like grave. It still is actually. My tooth is, I don't know if you ever noticed, I have like a little discoloration in one of my teeth. It was on dude's head. Yeah, and, it was, and like, you know, everyone's all hazy in Oxnard. So, like, for the next like six years, like, I'd be walking up at lunch, like, or walking up to some friends, and they'd be like, Our Captain Blocktooth is here. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so, you know, we played the next night. I had a big fat lip, and we played with like a, some. It was a band called Sub Incision. I think they were kind of like a street punk band, if I recall. Okay. And then there was another band called the uh, White Trash Debutantes. Like, I mean, th- these were just like rough, like, st- you know, Berkeley street punk type of people. And like, there was a low turnout of the show naturally. But then we were like these kind of fresh faced, like new school punk kids. And it did not go over well at all. I just remember like. You know that kind of expectation you have after you finish a song? Like, well, I, you know, let's like let's move to the songs really quick so if no one claps, it doesn't matter. But right. then, like, you get that quiet point. And usually you play a show and, like, if it's not going over too well, like, you hear, like, some kind of courtesy claps and then it kind of dies down. But there it was, like, one courtesy clap and then a one, one guy in the back just being like, you fucking suck. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a little defeating at that time because we had, like, that was just, like, the first taste of reality. We yeah, so defeating that you wrote a song about it, right? And that's just, it's kind of funny because you guys would go on to play, like, a ton and ton of shows where, like, inevitably when you're touring the country, you're going to play bad shows. Yeah. I know. I wish, I wish we had the clarity on that at the time that we wrote the song because it was such a big deal for us that we kind of wrote this this defeating song and then the song followed us for a long time you know like <laughs> like we, we, we played we, one bad show and it's like he cried about it right? I know he cried about it like I, you know, I remember when we signed to Vagrant like we'll get we'll get more into that later I'm sure but like when we signed to Vagrant they were like yeah you know we've kind of been like watching your progress and like we've, we've noticed how you guys have sort of 
grown and like evolved from this set, this first seven inch into this last LP. But that one song, man, nine to four, that is that song is t- like dog shit. What's up with that? And like, and, you know, we we go on and like the the owner of the label, Rich, he would never he would never let it go. Like we go on tour and then kind of sit down at the end of the tour with him and like kind of give him an update and be like, so how things go? And we'd be like, oh, you know, like play some small shows and you know, but it's it's, it's good to be home. And he kind of leaned back in his chair and he'd just be like, hey, man. You guys try as hard as you could, <laughs> <laughs> which is like a lyric of the song, you know. So yeah, it, that song kind of haunted us forever, and it's just, it's kind of funny. That's funny that uh, he hated that song, but he was cool with Ricky's Lake. Yeah, he didn't really. At least that one was like a, a standard Blink riff, you know. That's true. T formation. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and then after Cynical, Scarred came out, which was like kind of a. It was a it was a weird period kind of for No Motive, right? Like lots of demoing and lots of like experimenting with your sound, like maybe moving a little more hardcore, kind of like kind of like the split with uh, the choice, kind of songs like that, and just kind of all over the place, right? Yeah, we were kind of tapping into hardcore, but also um, kind of some of that '90s like emo stuff too. And so we were sort of splitting off in both those directions. But then we, we we couldn't really like completely shake like the the new school punk surfer thing either. So we were we were pretty schizophrenic in that way. Like, and I don't think that ever really left us. But particularly in that area, in that uh, era of the band, we were like we were like we had discovered Ignite at that point, which was like a game changer for like a lot of of us in our in our little Oxnard crew there. But so we were kind of tapping into that sound. And also playing some more kind of like emotive stuff, you know, like stuff that was a little softer and a little more sensitive, I guess. Um, I really liked that. Um, what was it? Uh, that uh, Embrace record, you know, that the that the Ian McKay was in. Yeah, they only did one. Yeah, that that record kind of kind of sparked a lot of uh, influence for me personally, and, and that's kind of like. What they were. Uh, Hi. Yeah. How's it going? Hi. Oh, so we'll we'll stop real quick. Stop. Kind of interesting to think about how to, like, where did we leave off, and is there just gonna be like a funny edit right there? Or no, nah, I don't think I'm gonna edit it. So we're back. Just full disclosure, me and Max actually we run a business together, and we put a sign on the door, but there's still gonna be people coming in and out. Sometimes people gotta get paid, you know. But uh, yeah, let's just jump right back to. Uh, we're talking about Scarred in that era, and uh, it's kind of like a funny narco tie-in because we were talking about Joey Lipke and like looking up to him and stuff. He's like an old school dude who was installing and shit. And so much related with Nardcore is Mystic Records and Doug Moody like bootlegging shit. Like for instance, Ill Repute, like they put out their classic album, What Happens Next, and then like three years later they were just like dicking around in the studio, like just demoing and fucking around and like Doug Moody like put out an LP called Transition that was like <laughs> just stuff that they never planned on coming out and it was it's terrible like I can't imagine I can't imagine what I would do if I was a band like dude we weren't planning on this coming out and it's not like a fucking LP it's a bunch of like demos you know like they didn't have anything to do with the sequencing or anything like you know and anyway that's kind of what Scarred was right like I think you were saying, like, he wasn't supposed to put it out. Like, it just came out. Yeah. Um, I can't remember, like, why it ended poorly with him, but... Well, that's probably why. I don't know. It ended poorly before that, and then he's just like, fuck you guys, and put out a record. Oh, yeah. Uh, we were on Varen already when he did that. Oh. Uh, you know, like, in retrospect, I'm grateful that, like, the record came out, because I, I'm not much of, like, a... I'm not very sentimental, and so in the few in the, in the little times when I do get sentimental, I can go on Spotify and like listen to that and like kind of revisit it. Sure. And a lot of that stuff just would have gotten like kind of buried in time. Yeah, there's a time you're you're making a real transition into like the you know the second real phase of the band and creating what became the the no motive sound and and what your band is. And so if you're saying that you're already signed to Vagrant and then he puts out this record of you guys sounding like totally different. Like that is pretty fucked up. Absolutely. And, and I remember like, 
us hitting him up about it and him just saying like, "Well, your contract, you guys owe us, you owe me another record, so I'm going to get it one way or the other." And so, yeah, he just kind of busted at Doug Moody and just threw that thing out there, and you know, no cover art input from us or anything. And uh, it's 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 just it's out there though, you know. I don't I don't think about it too much. And some of those songs are like they were just demos and never made the cut on anything. So it's kind of fun to go back and listen to it. So I guess no hard feelings at this point. No, it's cool. It just, it, it could have been put out in better context, right? Absolutely. I mean, if, if someone could have convinced us to do those songs, to release those songs, I think it would have been fun to have some input on that for sure. Yeah. So that is 1998. And, uh, 1998 is like a, a pretty prolific year for you because, Sadness Prevails comes out, which, like we just said, was like the the first no motive record of you guys really like finding the sound that you'd be known for. Mm -hmm. Um, But then also, that's Scarred, and also you played on the Standard Ground demo. How about that? (laughs) That's right. Yeah, like that was that was when the that kind of mid '90s, late '90s hardcore scene really sprouted up in Oxnard, and all of us were kind of pretty deep in that I mean I can't remember how we we really all dug so deep in that I think some of that Ojai crew guys really turned us on to some of the East Coast stuff if I recall maybe you have some input on that but um, well I became friends with the moon from Ojai because I was on AOL and we were talking in the hardcore chat room and I started noticing that like we basically we basically followed Ignite like everywhere they went which is kind of weird but like they were like a mind-blowing band to me like that call my brothers is like the ultimate crossover record if you're like into like no use for a name and lag wagon a lot of like the the fat and epitaph bands it's so like palatable that you uh, here we go again anyway it's so uh it's such like a palatable record to like dive into and it was like mind blowing to me because I like a lot of that that fat and that epitaph sound but I hate when bands have stupid fucking lyrics you know and, and Ignite was just a band that like their lyrics were great like a little over the top you know like saving pelicans and shit but like you know <laughs> but but still it was like hey at least like he, he like believed it and he talked about it and like you know it wasn't like singing about like Look at my cat. What can I be like that? Yeah, well, and also, like, the the way... Who produced that? Paul Miner? I don't know who did that. But the way that record sounds, too, like, the, dr- the drama of the lyrics actually matches the sound because that whole record sounds so big and kind of ambient. Yeah. That, like, it, it's, it's, very, it's very cohesive in that way, you know? Like, and I think that's kind of one of the things that I always loved about melodic music is it has a little more it has a little more like drama in it I mm-hmm. guess and, it, and that that's I think that's why that record was so impactful for so many of us was because it's like it had that melody and that drama but it was it, it was a legit hardcore record too at the same time yeah for sure so we followed them like we'd go to like every night show like and they played like really weird shows at that time I think just because like how you were talking about No Motive being ambitious I believe that they were as well because we saw him on really weird shows. Like we saw him play with like Mill and Cullen at the barn. And then we saw him play like, uh, with like the Aquabats and like San Bernardino. And then, then we got to see him on real hardcore shows too. But yeah, we were just following him all over. And then like, I started noticing like this kid, a moon and like him and his friends went to like all the same shows. I was like, well shit, we should meet. And then, yeah, we became friends. And then, um, you know, Zarian and, and a moon and JP, like they were all, really into hardcore, especially, like, Zarian, I guess, I can't remember if he was from Boston or he said a bunch of friends, but he, like, introduced us to a lot of music. Um, but we were all, we were already doing voice by then, you know? That's right, yeah. So we were already listening to, like, One Life Crew. <laughs> and, yeah, One Life Crew and Strife. And Outspoken was obviously a big influence for Voice, for voice of Defiance as well, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Voice of Defiance was, like... It was outspoken and and I guess like mouthpiece to a certain extent, mm-hmm. but better drumming. And- yeah, I think I think really what it was though is like that was when we started to even understand that there was a separation between hardcore 
and like we started to understand that there were like different way, like there were different factions of punk rock, right? Sure, yeah, there's like, always different scenes. Yeah, like when I was a kid and I was discovering that music, I would go to Salzer's and I would I would basically like handpick records based off of either like familiarity, like I you know I bought like an aggression record because like I I, I had seen the logo around and like had skulls wearing leather jackets and like it just felt right, but you know I grabbed like a Ramones record, an Exploited record, and like. Some stuff like that, and, and it had nothing to do with like me knowing anything about it. It was just like you're you're going off of the cover art, really, you know. Sure, and, and a little bit of name recognition of you, you've heard of the band, or you've seen it drawn on someone's backpack or their binder at school. Exactly, and and so we're like we're listening to stuff like you know seventy seven bands and hardcore bands and like eighties hardcore bands and then new school like Fat Records bands, and like we're not really like being snobby about it or identifying so much with one thing that like we're not discovering other music but then you know then we kind of went down the rabbit hole with like the hardcore stuff and kind of everyone started honing in on like what their uh, I don't know like what they identified with I guess a and little then, bit but I also don't think that Nard was ever that snobby and like I think part of that is because again our palette was so big with like what we listened to we never went down like oh I only listen to like straight edge revival or like I only listen to like the victory sound or I only listen to like fucking D beat. Right. You know, it was like like you were saying, like we just kinda listen to everything. Um I don't think that ever really changed. Like maybe there was a year or two. Not so much. We just started to know. It yeah, did, yeah. I don't think it scared us off from from discovering everything else, but we started to know there was a difference, right? Sure. I mean, you know, Oxnard's a small town really. Like especially when you're in like a little niche scene like that. And so you're, you're definitely going to be more open-minded because you know people that are into different stuff, right? Like, you know this this one dude is a Hessian. This other guy is, like, a fe- fence-walking Nazi dude. And, like, this, you know, this other guy is, like, a super PC, like, str- like a crusty punk guy. Yeah, it's not, it's like, not a big enough town that you have, like, the, the luxury of being, like... Like, apart from other people. Right. And, and also, like, we weren't... We weren't trying to, like... Uh, distinguish ourselves from anybody else because everybody kind of like knew each other on some level and and and, and we were we were friends to some degree. Yeah, know? in a smaller scene, everyone's important as well, right? Like you need kids that show up and pay the door. Right. Exactly. So who gives a fuck who they are as long as they're halfway nice, right? Yeah, but that year was really interesting. I mean, yeah, because you're on like both sides of the spectrum now, like of no motive, like finding their true sound and like you playing them like basically the most like. Probably the most generic music you ever played. Yeah. Yeah, and there were a lot of changes happening in the band, too. I mean, that was when Dave left the band. Uh, he he actually played on the first Vagrant. Uh, like, we went and did, like, a couple of songs for Vagrant to do, like, on a sampler for them. And he played on those. And that was exactly the transition when we got Roger uh, Camaro to play in the band. You know, Roger was, like... We were tight with him for a few years before that already because we were in high school together and he had played in uh, uh, what, was, what was his band? The, By All Means. By All Means, that's right. And, and he was in like half the little hardcore bands that were sprouting up too around town. Like Unknown Truth and like... Yeah, uh, and he was in Voice. He was in Voice, that's right. And he was also the the one kid in our crew that was um, recording bands. You know, he had a he had a four track and then he, he stepped it up and got an eight track. <laughs> And we'd record in his living room, and he'd record, he would like demo and demo of songs and stuff like that. And so it was kind of like the obvious choice when, uh, when Dave decided to leave the band. And so he jumped right in to No Motive right when we uh, signed a Vagrant. And that was also that was the time that we did our first tour also. You toured before the record came out? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we did. If I recall, we did not. Sadness and the sadness prevails had not quite come out yet because that, I think that actually technically came out in '99, and we had toured with uh, with Good Riddance around the the winter of '98, and those. I mean, that was just like a total stroke of luck. Pat actually uh, he tried out for the band um, after Forgotten Country, their, their drummer left and they were, they were auditioning drummers and Pat, Pat had tried out for the band and that's how we kind of got that line to them. And those guys, uh, those guys pretty much 
taught us, you know, Pat's really charismatic. So like somehow he was able to like try out for the band, not make the cut and then like continue some kind of, um, Dialogue. dialogue with them and this is like this is before cell phones right so he's obviously he's calling him on the phone and like right running up a long distance bill yeah and he's like you know he's calling Chuck or whatever and be like what are you doing right now <laughs> <laughs> and he's like why is this guy calling me but I don't know like they were they were gracious enough to uh, take us on tour we had played like two shows with them and Burning Dog actually before that um, but uh, they they took us on tour and it was I, I can't imagine like a better scenario like for a first tour because they were already killing it for one thing. So we were playing like legit shows every night. Yeah, if it's yeah. ninety, if it's ninety eight, they're already on their third LP. Yeah, I think it was uh, when when Ballads of the Revolution came out, right? So um, we were we were and, and they they just they showed us exactly what they do. Like here's here's what you need. You'll follow us in your van to like every show. First, you gotta hire Joe Rivas. First, yeah, that's right. We brought Joe with us, and uh, and he had already toured with Good Riddance. Like he had roadied for them uh, previously. So like everyone kind of knew each other, and the whole like touring shenanigans and everything I like oh, I learned that that was a thing you know sure. because their bass player Chuck's like pretty much insane like he he would <laughs> if, if you ever at a show and he knows you and you have your hands behind your back like you know you can, sometimes you stand you kind of like cross your hands behind your back sure you'll just out of nowhere you'll hear this like this voice in your ears going like oh yeah and then like he like sticks his dick in your hand you know <laughs> <laughs> and the funniest thing about it is like for me like I'm not seeing this happen but like the entire like there's 500 people that are watching him like stick his giant dick in my fucking hand <laughs> and, and so like that kind of stuff was you know it just it just schooled us really fast and 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 because they were so established, like, uh, just cr- inter- interesting things happened. Um, you know, we toured in Canada, and it was Canadian Thanksgiving, and they they made this huge, like, we we, we traveled into Canada for the first time and in, into uh, Winnipeg, if I recall. And when we got there, there was this, like, huge, like, Thanksgiving spread, but it was, like, all vegan, you know, and, like... And everything, we were just, we, it just felt so well cared for. It was a very, like, <laughs> it, it was definitely not, like, a good representation of, like, what a first tour should feel like. Because we did that after the fact, you know, when we when we toured on our own. Sure. And then that's that's when we got, like, the the reality, the the reality check on, like. The, ro- the road's rough. Yeah, like, the sleeping on a park bench because the van's 120 degrees and, like, and all that kind of stuff. Right, so did you go all the way around the U.S. and into Canada? That tour was a two week tour. It went it went basically to uh, Minneapolis, yeah. and then we cut up to Canada and then jammed back west, so, which was rad too because we, you know, went across the Canadian and drove across the Canadian Rockies and got to see the the auroras and stuff like that. And it oh, was like, sick. you know, I mean, for me, like the thing I miss the most about touring now that I'm a dad and I'm not playing music professionally is uh, there's no other like lifestyle that you could have where you just end up in the right place at the right time all the time. You know, like whether you're driving through the desert at sunset, it's really beautiful. Or you're driving through like Wyoming and Montana and like, you just get to experience these things that like normal people don't get to see in their lives. Cause people will go travel, but they're, they're A to B, you know? And on tour, it's like, you have nothing but time. It's a bunch of hurry up and wait. Like even at shows, like you're, if you're lucky enough to get a sound check, then you're like, you have a three hour window before and a four hour window after. And then like, and so you're, you're just kind of like, I don't know, you're just kind of, you're just kind of wandering around these different areas and finding yourselves in parts of the country that. Yeah. And while you're so young and, and like somehow pulling it off, right. It's just, it's weird. It's really weird to think about. Also, I agree with you like about the point A to point B because like to get a feel for a lot of like the cities in the middle of America, like I feel like you need to drive up on them. Like, can you imagine if you just flew from like San Diego to Kansas City? Like, you just go up city to city and fly home. Like, it might not even feel like that different. But like, if you're driving and it's like there's fucking nothing, and then like suddenly you're in a city. Like, I mean, maybe Chicago is the best example of that, or Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. You know, you just come out of nothing and then you're in a city. It's like. It's pretty fucking mind blowing. It really is. It really is. And it, you know, that was pretty cell phone too in those days and so 
if you wander off or something and get lost, it's actually kind of a big deal, you know? Oh, yeah. You know, like, yeah. It, that happened a handful of times where... Or you break down. Or you break you, down. You break yeah. down and you're you're walking to, like, one of those boxes and, and hoping someone on the other line is going to pick up and then you can describe where you are. Yeah, and you're, like, you know, you're using Thomas guides, like, to get from yeah. A to B and... I don't know, you're sitting in a laundromat in Mississippi somewhere and and it's like this really impoverished like area and you're just kind of I don't know, I, I just can't I can't imagine not having experienced that and I feel like it actually gives me a little bit of a uh not an unrealistic filter, but I I definitely don't experience things the same way as I would have had I never like seen so much so young yeah i mean it's 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 really creating a base for the way that you're going to look at the world right i mean there there's a there's a reason i think why more open-minded people are in like the more populated areas right because you you're around so many different types of people and you realize like everyone's pretty cool you know like there's no boogeyman that's right you know and and so like with traveling and so forth you realize that like everyone around is just trying to like do their thing you know like there's no there's no boogeyman there's so much like out there these days it's like trying to divide us and uh and i think that like having that experience of of traveling and meeting so many different people from so many different places like it it really it it helps me cut through like the white noise of fear Mm -hmm. yeah you kind of see that there's I mean, kind of back to what I was saying earlier about the, the friend set that you have growing up in Oxnard, where you actually, like, grow up with these guys that end up becoming, like, really shady people. Um, same thing as, like, being in the Midwest uh, on tour and kind of interacting with people because they have completely different uh, value sets than you do. And their entire world is, is, complete, like, is completely different than what you're experiencing. I mean... I mean, do you remember, like, touring and trying to find a decent thing to eat? I mean, you go to the Midwest, and it's, like, the grocery stores, you get iceberg lettuce and, like, green tomatoes. You know, like, they're, they're just the exposure to what we, like, luckily, living in California, or if you live in the bookends, or if you live, like, in a metropolis or something like that, you have access to so much culture and so much food and so much uh, influence, you know? And then you go into these smaller towns and you realize that like they, they have a very uh, a very small kind of scope that they're sort of like looking through. And so, you know, when, when it comes to sort of like the some of the political stuff and, and just value sets, it's kind of hard to uh, relate sometimes. But it's also important to like recognize that people have a different reality and they really are like not experiencing the same reality that you are and so it's kind of it's it's easier to get on the same page with them and not not just become so uh, divisive about everything yeah so do you demo before you said you demoed a little bit before sadness what i'm trying to get at is you your sound got completely overhauled and you went to something that that ended up being pretty special like as a band and for for your fans like how did how did such a radical change in sound come about? Gosh. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think Roger joined the band. Well, there was a couple things, right? We, we had kind of uh, broadened our, our scope of influence a little bit. Like, we, we liked that band far a lot at that time also. And I hated that band. Yeah, I could see that. And I could see like why a lot of people would hate that band. But the the loud, soft, loud, soft thing, I mean, you know, commercially like that was like a, a Nirvana deal or whatever, like sure. soft verse, loud chorus. But that band kind of like, um, they kind of turned us on a little bit to that, that idea of like dynamic in music. Sure. And um, we were tapping into that, but also like with Roger joining the band, we we were able to kind of just workshop things a lot more, you know, because he was so resourceful and uh, he was able to demo us and his brother's like a total like audiophile. Mm-hmm. Also, he has an older brother. It's like, I think he's 10 years older than, than we are. If I recall, uh, Ray and he was into the kind of like, he was sort of into the, the, the darker stuff from the eighties and nineties, like, you know, like Nick cave and American music club and, uh, he turned he turned me on like the the pixies and like you know stuff like that and 
So we were all kind of discovering a broader scope of music and at the same time, like having more tools to, to play and demo and listen back and kind of like see how things are shaping up. Um, so yeah, that, that, I think that was really like the biggest, the biggest reason that we are like, I think to a lot of people, our sound kind of like, like did like a, a hard right turn out of nowhere. But for us, it was just because we were we were working a lot, like we were writing a lot and doing a lot of a lot of music at that time, and so it just it just evolved or or devolved if if that's your take on it, like really quickly. You know, we turned we became what whatever No Motive sort of was for the next like couple records, uh, really quickly. And was that when you stopped covering Talk Is Cheap? No, man, we did that. <laughs> we did that well into the the, th- the third bigger record. For us, yeah, it, yeah. I mean, the, the, us covering that song was novel to begin with, right? So why stop? Why like, stop? If, if shit really hit the fan at a show, like even later on, we would just be like, "Fuck it, let's just play Talk Is Cheap." Let's play Talk Is Cheap and get the fuck out of here. Yeah, and then I just like stage dive in the crowd, and my my <laughs> chord would come out of my guitar, and, and everything would just be a total disaster, you know? Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good back pocket song, yeah, right? <laughs> so how prolific were you right after Sadness? It comes out and, like, I don't know, how, how well-received was it, like, in, in general? And uh, how were you getting, like, your feedback at that time? Well, Sadness was, uh, it was, nationally, it it worked, you know? Like, we were touring, people were responding well, and, uh, and it was, we, we had no, like, second, second guess, guesses about, like, like, where we were headed with that. Locally, it didn't really transfer over. I mean, I think, I think in, in Oxnard and Ventura, you know, we, we got a lot of accolades, um, kind of on the face of things, because people were just stoked that there was a local band that was actually, like, sign a, a legitimate record label and touring and and doing all that stuff and so people kind of tended to respond positively to us uh as people you know we're all nice guys too um but um i, I kind of always knew that there was like a little snickering you know behind the back happening and that that's just kind of like a, a byproduct of like changing your your sound and like you know to begin with we were never really like that punk or that hardcore anyway and so you know it was working for us like because that's what we wanted to do but i do think that like it it playing in our hometown was always really difficult you know like people wanted to hear the fast stuff the seven inch stuff and we were like already over the 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 songs on sadness like we were already trying like like thinking about the next move and and so when we go to do our set list it was always really challenging you know because we're like trying to play songs that hadn't even come out yet. And like, you know, I, I'm a little more objective about things now. Like if I were to go back, I would probably be like, well, people want to hear this stuff. Let's play it. You know? Well, that is a really interesting thing about the motive. And it's, it was bold in one way. Right. It's like you, I don't know when you play in a band, there's such a balance between like what you want to play and what, what you need to deliver if you expect kids to like pay at the door. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you guys were like pretty bold early on. Like even after like cynical was like pretty new and like not playing songs off it, you know, like I remember we we, we were in, uh, Oh man, what's the college area right outside of Goleta? Isla Vista. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You guys were playing like some outdoor show and there was like some frat dude and he was like, he started out all like, all kind of friendly, like, hey guys, uh, play Friends, man, I love that song, you know, and you guys are like, oh, well, I don't know, man, don't know if we're going to get around to it, you know, and this is like, I live Vista is like, party central, like, this is dudes cruising down the streets, like, drinking tall cans, fucking getting high, like, partying, and you know, like, there's all these different parties going on, so maybe there's like, 30 people congregating in the front, like, watching a band, you know, so, in between the songs, it's very easy to, like, talk to you guys. You kind of blow him off, and like he starts getting a little, a little more heated. Like, nah, man, like, uh, play Friends, man. That's like my favorite song. Like, you know, the CD just came out. You know, <laughs> like you're like, I don't know, man. Like, not, not really playing Friends, you know. And and then like, you know, a few more songs later, he's like, 
Hey, play friends, you fucking motherfuckers. I'll <laughs> yeah. fuck you up. Like, I remember him well, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's like, he's pretty aggro. So, like, you were making those decisions, like, even back then, like, you were still a pretty young band, like, just did your first CD, and you're like, we're kind of, like, we're on the, the we're on the kick of, like, just doing it for us, and either you're along for the ride or you're not, right? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I if I have any, like, kind of, not like regrets, but like if I were to sort of uh, kind of triage like what happened with no motive, like why we didn't do better, like ultimately than we did, it's because with there there was a bit of an arrogance there on our part that like it, it, we were just very uncompromising, but not with like um, sound logic necessarily. It was just very much like this is what we feel like doing, and we don't really like it. It, it seems.